So, hello, my name is Chris Barkin, and I want to welcome all of you to the William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar here at the University of Illinois. Before I introduce our speaker, we have a couple of housekeeping items we'd like to take care of. First of all, you all know the drill. If you take out your cell phones, please turn them off or turn the vib them to vibrate so that they don't disturb the speaker. If we have a fire alarm, I'm going to ask you to exit from these doors and then go down the stairs and uh, at the base of the stairs, in each case, um, there's an exit. And I'll ask you to exit the building. And I'm going to ask that we go north and carefully cross Main Street watching for traffic or oncoming fire trucks and um, assemble next to the hydro systems lab. We'll use the buddy system, so make note of who's next to you and make sure that they get out safely, yeah. please. I don't think we're expecting severe weather, but if we were to have severe weather, we need to uh, exit from this door, and we can also go from that door. We have to head into west into the old part of Newmark Laboratory, through the doors into the original part of the building, and then immediately turn right down the stairs all the way to the basement, which is a very safe location. Uh, we'll be passing around this uh, attendance sheet. So I'd ask everybody to please sign that, uh, including your name and affiliation. And if you did not receive a direct email announcement of this seminar but would like to in the future, please legibly write your email address on this sheet. Um, and also, if you want to receive CEU credit for your participation, just check the box accordingly. I'd like to welcome those that are phoning in. Um, we appreciate your participation. We have representatives from Trinity Industries, HDR, uh, Transportation, Transport Environmental Systems, AECOM, CSX, Kansas City Southern, CH2M Hill, Rail Sciences, US EPA, University of British Columbia, uh, Metro Transit, uh, University of Manitoba, Toba, uh, Parsons, <coughs> Bowman Barrett and Associates, Parsons Brinkerhoff, PPCI, and Kimikata Rail Consulting and CTA. Welcome all of you. We really appreciate your uh, interest and participation. And uh, I think those of you who are, are phoning in, if you'd like to receive CEUs uh, for your participation, please send an email. I think it's going to you now. Uh, it's with, uh, with, if you receive the email um, announcement, I, excuse me, I'm forgetting, is it Katya or it's Katya? Okay, so send an email to Katya and she'll uh, make sure you get onto the list to receive your CEUs. Um, okay, so Mike, yeah, so we're, uh, we're going to have a, uh, I'm sorry, it's a little early. Oh, sorry. sorry. That's right. <laughs> hang, hang on. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so and I'll just ask the speaker if there are any questions from the audience here, if you could repeat them, that'll help uh, the people calling in hear those questions. So with this, I'd like to introduce our Arena Student uh, Chapter Vice President, Mike Romack, who's going to announce our happy hour. Hi, I'm Mike Wanak. I'm the VP of the Raymond Student Chapter. We are, looks like to let everyone know, we are having a happy hour today at the Blind Pig, Blind Pig Brewery on Neal Street. Uh, speaker, Mr. Pritchoff here, will be there, I believe. Uh, so it'll be a great opportunity to have a drink with him, ask some questions, have a good time. Uh, I believe it starts at 5.30. Uh, love to see you there. Thanks, Mike. The William W. Hay Railroad Seminar Series is sponsored by Norfolk Southern Corporation here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And on behalf of all of us here at the University, we thank Norfolk Southern for their ongoing support. It's greatly appreciated by uh, all of us on campus as well as those participating via the internet. Understanding the causes and remedies of reverse rail camp have become increasingly important in re recent years and became of particular interest to Norfolk Southern due to several recent derailments they experienced in which rail roll rollover was a primary contributing factor. Norfolk Southern initiated research to understand the phenomenon, the contributing factors, and potential mitigation strategies, and this led to a joint investigation with PCCI and Pueblo on reverse camp and camp rail rotation that began in early 2001, and that's going to be the subject of our presentation today. Our speaker is Brad Kirchhoff, who is Director of Research and Tests for Norfolk Southern. Mr. Kirchhoff completed his BS in Civil Engineering at the University of Virginia, and began his railroad career as an engineering management trainee with Conrail. One of his early assignments included an 18-month tour at TTC, and perhaps that was the genesis of your involvement in rail research. And uh, meanwhile, uh, back at Conrail, he rose to the level of division engineer, serving in that capacity in Pittsburgh and Indianapolis. 
When Conrail was acquired by Norfolk Southern, he became Division Engineer in Birmingham, Alabama, and then served as Norfolk Southern's Director of Engineering in Atlanta, where his duties included engineering liaison to North Carolina's uh, DOT's passenger rail program before taking his current position in early 2011. He's a registered professional, professional engineer in Pennsylvania. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Mr. Brad Kirchhoff. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, I've had a uh, very enjoyable uh, two days here. This is my first visit, and uh, I think I, I comment. I've made this comment a couple times. Uh, when I got my civil engineering degree, my railroad education consisted of about a half a class in surveying, where we just discussed frogs and the two definitions of. Curvature, and that was it. And uh, you've got at this school uh, a dozen or more railroad engineering classes. In fact, one guy at lunch said, "I can. I, I went here, and there, there was no way I could. I could take all these classes." Um, railroading back in the late '70s was, was at periscope depth. I think it's uh, it's really changed over the last 30 years. And uh, I'm excited for you if you're interested in, in sticking with this industry. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, help of a co-conspirator, uh, Dr. Huyman Wu from TTCI. Uh, she and I have worked together on this uh, on this test, uh, and uh, has been just a wonderful, wonderful person to work with. Um, questions. I would much prefer this not to be a lecture. If you have a question, uh, I want you to feel obligated to ask it. Um, rather than waiting to the end of the uh, end of the session, if you have something that you don't understand, please ask. And maybe someone else who doesn't have, it, who has an equal uh, uh, lack of understanding. And I realize we've got probably a very wide range of, I'll say, railroad track um, aptitude here. And um, my talk is pretty much directed to people with a, a good background in, in, in track maintenance. So I would feel a lot better if you had. Questions. If I don't explain something just right, please ask a question. I'll be I'll be happy to answer. As Chris mentioned, the uh, the motivation for this work uh, had to do with a number of uh, rail rollover derailments that Ennis suffered over the past uh, ten years. We had uh, three or four of them uh, in the last three or four years. Um, we knew the rail rolled over. What was frustrating about these derailments was the fact that the track was in excellent condition using our, our normal parameters. Tie condition was wonderful, gauge okay, rail condition fine, um, track geometry perfect. Uh, and we got to thinking that if, you know, if this truly were a track problem, we're in a heap of hurt because the conditions that existed at this, at this derailment existed in thousands of other curves around the Norfolk Southern system. So it, we, we, took, we, we had some urgency to try to figure out <coughs> what happened. But before I get into my talk, uh, we're going to do some prerequisite work here. Um, there are two concepts to understand uh, that will, I think, make my presentation uh, a lot more manageable. Uh, the first one has to do with vehicle curving. Can someone ask, can answer me this question? Why does a car or truck go around a curve so easily? It has a differential. The vehicle can allow the low wheels to turn at a different rate than the high wheels. And if it's the front axle, they're not connected. If it's the back axle, they've got a differential. I'm old, I don't remember. <laughs> um, the, the, the issue is the distance traveled by the high rail or the high side further than distance traveled by the, by the low side. Um, a railroad axle is a fixed system. We've got two wheels that are pressed onto an axle, and they turn at the same rate. In order to get a wheel set to negotiate a curve, something else has to go to work here, and that is uh, what we what we call um, conical wheels. 
If you look at a railroad wheel carefully, it has a taper. From the flange end, from the flange end it's got a larger diameter out toward the outside of the thread, <coughs> diameter shrinks. New freight wheels have a 1 in 20 cant, a 1 in 20 taper. And if you have a rolling contact point on the high rail that's closer to the wheel flange at a place of larger radius, and a contact point on the low rail further out on the tread at a point of smaller rolling radius, that wheel set will actually steer itself around the curve. Conical wheels, rolling radius differential, high wheel rolls further than the low rail, allows the wheel to negotiate the curve. That's a key concept to understand for the rest of my presentation. Second key concept, what is standard gauge? 56 and a half. 56 and a half. Okay, here we go. Here's my outline. I'm going to describe rail camp, uh, what it is and what contributes to it. I'll describe a rail camp test that we, uh, we conducted. I'll describe the test variables, which were the various track maintenance conditions for that test. Best results, conclusions, and next steps. Description of rail can. Um, the vertical axis of the rail in its normal design position is canted slightly into gauge. And the reason for that is because it's sitting on a tie plate that's got a cant. In, in Norfolk Southern's case, and in most, most of North American railroading, it's a 1 in 40 cant. The reason we have a 1 in 40 cant, remember what I said about the wheel? We've got a 1 in 20 wheel taper. That gives you a more desirable contact location when those two tapers are mashed up. When, when the rail is, uh, exists in this, I'll say, design position, on that as we call that zero, zero degrees of cant. And any rotation of the rail from that orientation um, is what we call, if, it's, if it goes to the outside, it's called outward cant. If it rotates to the inside, it's, it's inward cant. I've identified, and most people have identified, two types of rail cant. Static cant, which is the rotation of the rail not under load, and the dynamic cant, which is the additional rotation of the rail caused by wheel loading. Any idea how I'm going to get this video to play? Just click on the image. Click on the image? Yeah. Bingo. Thank you. Now, what you looked at was a video of what I describe as almost no can. A very desirable condition. Now, if all, all, our, if all of our rail responded to wheel loading like this, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. The rail is sitting flat on the tie plate. Tie plate is sitting almost flat on the tie. Uh, and, and we have a situation where the rail pretty much maintains its same orientation underneath that, uh, underneath that frame. All right, let's talk about static cant and the contributions to static cant. Uh, probably the, uh, the, the best known contribution to static cant is tie plate cutting. Typically when the outside edge of the tie crushes the wood fibers and depresses into the tie, it's also called differential tie plate cutting because the tie plate is no longer parallel to the top of, 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 of an undamaged tie. Second contribution to rail cant could be uneven adzing. Um, an adzer is a piece of maintenance away equipment that trims the tie after the rail and the tie plates have been removed. We use it to put, we use it to restore a, a flush surface for a tie plate uh, a head, uh, as, as, as part of a, a gauging gang job or a, or a rail gang job. Would you, uh, in this case, it looks like we have a fairly, fairly high quality installation. But in fact, when the geometry car ran on this curve, it measured 1.5 degrees of outward can. And it has everything to do with the fact that when the answer came by, instead of cutting a surface that was parallel to the original surface on the top of the tie, 
it took a bigger bite out of the field side than it did out of the gauge side, and the result was the tie plate was canted out. 1.5 degrees of can, and, and walking the track, you'd never know it. Yes? What's the reference frame for the ads? The reference frame of the ads are, um, depending on the type of equipment, it could rotate about, about a, a, a hinge on the opposite rail, and, and that could in, introduce uh, an uneven cant. Or on the newer machines, it's, it's mounted on top of the track, and I don't know enough about it to know what the, what, how, what, what's involved in the, in, in the adjustments, but they do need to be adjusted because they can get out of level. Did I answer your question, Ryan? Would the other rail seat be off, or is it in between the end control? So is the other side 1.5? All right, quite, question is, uh, if, we, if we add to one side, what's the impact on the other side? Uh, nothing, because we haven't taken the rail out on the other side. Um, and that's assuming we're working a single side rail gang. Um, NS does have a dual gang where we add both sides simultaneously. We'd have to worry about the, uh, you know, the can on the opposite side in that case. A third contribution, contribution to uh, rail can is worn tie plates. Um, the top photograph shows a tie plate that has been, has been in a curve for quite some time. My guess it could be a low rail. And for much of that tie plate's life, the only, the only part of the tie plate that was actually supporting the rail was the field side three inches. It's been years since the rail touched the gauge side three inches on that tie plate. And over time, the side-to-side -side motion of the rail rubbing against the softer tie plate steel causes that tie plate to wear away. And you can see in the bottom left photograph uh, a side view of a similar tie plate and a uh, taper gauge and a straight edge showed 10 64 inches of wear um, on the uh, field side of the rail seat. Can you give a, just a general idea of the uh, order of magnitude of the problem? Question is, order of ma how big is the order? What, what, what's the order of magnitude of this problem? Um, the uh, next slide I'm going to show you, which is actually a video of a worn tie plate. Um, 12 years old on a line that's got 50 million gross tons. Um, typically, uh, it's been my observation that the low rail uh, will, develop, will develop this condition much more rapidly than the high rail. Um, when I was up on Conrail's, or excuse me, Norfolk Southern's Pittsburgh division um, last month. I was talking about this phenomenon to the, to the track supervisor I knew, and you know, we looked at a bunch of curves and did some talking. He doesn't have that problem at all. Well, the reason he doesn't have that problem is because um, for the last 10 years, he's done nothing but change out pandrel plates that have been put in by Conrail in the 1980s and early 1990s. Um, so all of his tie plates were less than 10 years old. Didn't have a problem. Um, I'd say on NS, it's certainly a bigger problem than, than we realize because we've only identified this problem recently. Um, I would say that if you've got a heavy tonnage line and your tie plate's been in track for 10 years and your curvature is 5 degrees or more, um, chances are you've got worn tie plates. And this is a progressive phenomenon, so you know I can take you out to a type of curve that has, is 9 years old and you may have a 16 uh, inch square, uh, take you to, to a curve that's 15 years uh, in track. Uh, and you may have you may have um, three sixteenths. Okay, um, what we're looking at here is a worn tie plate. If you look at the left hand side of the photograph, um, if you look hard, you can see that the surface actually drops off. It's difficult to see because you're using the rail as kind of a reference <coughs> for straight edge. But if you, use, if you start off on the right-hand side of the tie plate and extend that line to the left-hand side of the photograph, you should see the tie plate surface actually diverges from that straight line. And you know, the previous photograph where you had two and a half inches of, 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 or three inches of worn surface on the field side, that's what you're looking at.
Okay. Now, worth noticing is, or worth noting is that um, this rail base rarely pivoted up on its gauge side, or excuse me, on its field side corner. Most of the time, when the rail was depressed into the tie plate, a wheel was on top. The rail was supported by a flush contact between the field side, two or three inches of rail base, and the field side, two or three inches of tie plate. Okay? And even though we have an eighth of an inch of tie plate wear, our geometry car still measured two, better than two degrees of can just because of rail can, just because of worn tie plate. <clears throat> Another contribution to static can. Uh, hot and cold weather. Hot weather, compressive forces, rail tries to roll toward the outside of the curve. Because of the, of the section modulus of a rail, it's easier to rotate about the base, so it tries to lift up and rotate outward. Um, the degree of, 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 of rotation is determined by two things. The difference between the neutral temperature of the rail, that is to say it's stress-free temperature, or the temperature it was laid at, and the actual temperature. If you've got a rail temperature that measures 120 degrees and, it was, and, the, and your stress-free temperature is 60 degrees, you've got a heck of a lot of compression. That rail is really going to want to try to rotate out of the tie plate. The second thing that determines how much rotation you have is how high the spikes are pulled up out of the ties. Temperature will not cause spikes to pull up out of the ties unless your ties are in awful condition. What causes the spikes to, be, to raise up out of the ties is the interaction between wheel and rail. It's the dynamic forces that lift the spikes. Rail temperature is just taking advantage of the free, mo free movement that's available to it. And just as hot weather uh, causes rails to roll to the outside of the curve, cold weather, hot weather to the high side, cold weather causes rail to try to rotate toward the inside of the curve. And here we've got the same thing as the previous photograph, only a different time of year. All right, we've talked about stat static cant, but now we're going to talk about dynamic cant. A dynamic cant, the amount of rail rotation caused by wheel loading. It can vary from truck to truck. And dynamic cant is included in geometry car gauge and cant measurements. How much cant, how much dynamic cant is your track experiencing? It's, it's really a fairly easy measure. If you just look down at the base of the rail, confirm you have that telltale shiny mark that indicates that the rail is rotating up and contacting the raised spike head under train movement, and measure the gap. This is probably three to four degrees of can right there. Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, we were start getting, we start, started to get into, in, really interested in rail can. Um, the first thing we wanted to do was confirm that the, tr that, that the rail was in fact rotating outwards as far as our track geometry car said it was. There were a lot of people in the engineering department that said, hey, we're rotating out three degrees. We can't see it. We don't believe it. So we uh, adopted this caveman technology. It's called a fish gauge. Uh, and the way it works, uh, the, uh, there's a spring-loaded uh, plunger that rests against the uh, field side head of the rail. When the rail is displaced outward, the, the, the spring-loaded plunger displaces. That plunger is attached to a white washer. It displaces and pushes against the black washer. When the rail restores itself to its static position, <coughs> the plunger returns, so does the white washer, measure the gap between the white washer and the black washer, and you have static rail can. And then you have, and you have your dynamic rail can. Um, problem with this measurement technology is it doesn't take into account static can, and the only thing we see is the worst can for a train. We don't see what each car is doing. So we decided we needed to up our uh, technology game. We set up a rail camp test site, an official rail camp test site, on our Roanoke to Bluefield main line. It's a coal route. On a 7.8 degree curve, timetable speed 25 miles an hour, super elevation 4 inches. Uh, we had 8 by 18 inch tie plates with cut spikes. Loaded gauge was 57 and 3 eighths. And most importantly, we already have a curve that had 
three degrees of rail pant on both high and low rails. So we had something that was very close to requiring maintenance right at the start of our test. We put strain gauges uh, on the high rail and low rail to measure lateral and vertical forces, and we installed spring pots to measure displacement. After about a month, we uh, did away with the spring pots uh, for much the same reason we did away with the uh, fish gauge earlier. Uh, it didn't measure static cant, um, which makes it was a big reason. Now this test site has turned out to be a, uh, a gold mine of information in terms of lateral forces under, a, under a, a large number of track maintenance conditions. We got nine of them identified. We started out with both rails at three degrees of can, to gauge 57 and 3 eighths. We have a first grinding cycle. Uh, number three, we installed elastic fasteners on the high rail and gauge the track at 56 and 3 eighths. What standard gauge? 56 and a half. Elastic fasteners installed on the low rail. Gauge was, we opened the gauge up a little bit. We turned our top of rail friction modifier on. We brought our grinding grinder back for cycle number two. We turned the top of rail off. We came back for grinding cycle number three. And then we turned our top of rail back on. Now, don't be intimidated by this graph. Um, this, is, this is our results. And uh, I'm going to show you how this graph is laid out right now, and I'm going to come back later in the presentation and we'll spend some more time on it. The way it's laid out, horizontal axis is train number. Uh, we measured lateral and vertical forces under 560 loaded coal trains at this test site. So you see a dot for each train. Vertical axis is lateral force, and the scale is from 0 to 25 tips. Each dot represents the average force for an entire train for one of four wheel positions. Leading wheel high side, leading wheel low side, they're in the top graph. Trailing wheel high side, trailing wheel low side, they're in the bottom graph. The low rail forces are blue and the high rail forces are pink. The green arrows and the blue arrows represent changes in track maintenance conditions. All right, you can kind of get a seal for the trends here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through each of the track maintenance conditions. And as I do, see if you can <coughs> forecast how you think the lateral forces will, re will react as a result of, of, of what track we perform. We'll come, to, we'll come back to this later. Starting condition number, uh, condition number one was our starting, starting condition. Uh, eight by eight, 18 inch tie plates. With spikes, gauge under load 57 and 3 eighths, high rail and low rail, 3 degrees of outward can. Also, abundant gauge face lubrication, but no top of rail friction modifier. We had units in the neighborhood, but they were turned off. Condition number two, grinding cycle number one. We brought our 96 stone rail grinder through. Each rail got five passes. We did a very nice job in the low rail, restoring a good radius, field side and gauge side relief. Our objective was to try to put the wheel contact pattern right back in the middle of the railhead, and we did a good job. On the lower, on the high rail, however, we made a mistake. Um, our template process does not take into account canted rail. We, we, we applied our template, template to a canted rail, and as a result, the grinding software identified an artificially high gauge side and an artificially low field side. Result, we ground the crap out of the gauge side, didn't touch the field side. Yeah? Okay. Yes? When you said three degrees can't on both rails, that means static can't? Outward static can on three degrees on both rails? Outward static can on both rails, uh, as measured by our track geometry car, which means we're looking at static and dynamic combined. Um, yeah, um, I'm sorry for, for the folks at home. Um, the, the question, um, Ryan, ask that question again. I'm sorry. I was just wondering if you looked at the cause of outward can on both rails. Okay. Um, 
question is cause of outward pain on both rails. Well, if you look at if you look at an axle with a free body, if you if you you know if you have 15 kips going to one side, you're going to have 15 kips going up, going to the other side, roughly. Um, you're not going to have a situation where you have very high forces on one rail and no forces on the other rail. Lateral forces. Lateral forces. Okay, um, here is a uh, cross section, not, not, from, uh, not from the high rail wheels, but from a rail from a different location. And you can see uh, we've got the uh, new rail profile uh, superimposed uh, on a worn high rail profile. And the red arrow indicates the gauge corner. And you can see that uh, due to substantial rail grinding, we have really lowered the rail height on that gauge corner. And where is the high spot on the field side? Excessive gauge side grinding plus insufficient field side grind, grind, grinding and we're likely to end up with a wheel contact pad, band toward the field side of the rail. Track maintenance condition number three. The division was not satisfied with the track conditions with the gauge and the three degrees of sand. They came along and installed elastic fasteners on the high rail. Uh, this is a Norfolk Southern design plate, an 8 by 18 inch kite plate with two pandrel shoulders on either side and then we use a pandrel leaf up to, uh, to uh, restrain the rail. We gauge the track inadvertently tight to 56 and 3 eighths. Because we took that rail that had been existing with a three degree of outward cant and set it upright, restored a one and forty cant, we actually moved the wheel contact pattern pattern from what had been roughly the entire surface of the railhead to fairly well concentrated on the field side. The low rail stayed with 18, 8 by 18 inch tie plates uh, and cut spikes. We were interested to see what the low rail response was to this track maintenance condition. So we got ourselves a video camera, a high-tech lighting system, <laughs> and we rolled tape. Now, as you're watching this, I want you to do, in addition to watching, I also want you to listen, okay? What did you notice? I mean, besides the rail that was tipping over. A lot of flange contact. Okay, this is, we're looking at the low rail, but it, we may be here in the high rail. Okay, what else did you notice? There's some kind of weird chatter. Okay. Audio. Okay. All right. Um, as as information, um, we uh, at seven eighths of an inch between. Base and uh, and tie plate. That's about eight degrees of cant. That's the most I've ever measured. Um, other things worth noticing: that chatter you heard. What do you think that is? Wow, well, guess. I'll guess. Flat wheels. A defect with the wheel. Not in this case. Um, what you're actually hearing is the situation friction saturation between wheel and rail interface. We develop enough friction force with the wheel rail canted out and all of a sudden the rail slips inward and tries to restore itself to its to its static position. Wheel slides over the top. That's that that rat that thud 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 that you're hearing. The other thing worth noticing is that the rail when it canted up didn't stay there. It was going up and down, up and down. The, vari the variable there is freight car. Different trucks, based on their condition and their design, will cause the rail to react differently. 
Now we're going to watch this tape again, I hope, and uh, let's see if we can pick up on on, on what we uh, what we just talked about. The scary tape. And as you hear it, you can also probably see a visual rapid response to that rail as well. Now when that happens, typically damage results to the rail. If you see these posted stamp top size scuff marks on your head, chances are that the last train that went through there had some very high lateral forces. That's actually plastic flow of the rail steel. You're looking at. Brad? Yes. So, something else I noticed during that, and I think maybe this is what you're referring to, is that um, it seems like the rail interaction with the plate was varying depending on the particular, I guess, car or truck that was going over it. Right. In which I'm <coughs> interpreting as a different point of contact between the wheel and the rail. It could be, yeah, it could be a different point of contact. Um, and there were some times when the right hand side came all the way down, and other times when it was more on the left side. Um, okay. Um, I, I pretty much viewed this as a, as a hinge uh, about the base of the rail. I mean, you, if you have a wheel on top, you're always going to have, it, you figure, you're always, always going to have the rail being supported by some part of the tie plate. The, uh, in this particular instance, um, keep in mind where the high rail contact band is. It's toward the field side. When we talked earlier about rolling, uh, rolling radius differential, desirable, rolling, desirable wheel, wheel contact on, on the high rail is actually in toward the flange on the gauge half of the head. We've got, we've got contact on the high rail on the field half of the head. Question? Yes. Um, so that was um, um, low rail. And it's slipping from gauge side. It's slipping. It's. I've seen it in in, uh, in two different situations. If we have elastic fasteners and the rail is held down tightly, I've seen the wheel slide with respect to the rail. It's like the wheel tries to climb up on the high side and then slides back down. If you have cut spikes and a very flexible low rail. Uh, I've seen that rail try to can out and then plop back down. So it's 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 movement between it's relative movement between the wheel and the rail, um, but in terms of um, referencing an immovable object off to the side, uh, sometimes it's the wheel set that's moving with respect to the track. Sometimes it's the rail moving with respect to the wheel. Good. All right, we move the camera 40 feet up the track. From the first video location, we found spikes that were already raised up seven eighths of an inch. We drove two of them down without tie plugging in advance of a train. And then we started our camera. Um, take away from that video? Not much hold down for us. Um, <laughs> if you simply drive spikes down into the tie without plugging them, you're wasting your time. Second thing, um, spikes are not designed and don't do a very good job providing vertical restraint in, uh, in an environment of very high rollout forces. Can I ask one more, one more question? Yeah. In terms of discussion, there are several of us that are discussing 
exactly what is the average hold down force for a test flight? I understand that's not his primary. You know, we've got about 5,000 pounds for rail case and illegal after tax on this. Um, a new, well, let's see here. I think a new spike driven in a new tie, a new oak tie, the extraction force is, I think, around 6,000 pounds. Six to 7,000 pounds, I believe. David, that's not right? Yeah, six, six to 8,000 pounds. If you double that for us, maybe more than double, quadruple that for us. New ties. Okay, these are, these are not new ties, so it's going to be a little lower. Um, in view of what happened under track maintenance condition number three, you can understand why the, why the division rapidly responded with track maintenance condition number four. <coughs> they installed panels under the low rail, uh, same, uh, same equipment as, as on the high rail. Um, we realized we made a mistake with the tight gauge in the first installation. We intentionally opened the gauge above standard to 56 and three quarters for this installation. That low rail, having existed for many years in a cannon outward position, was now set back upright to a new 1 and 40 can. And you can see that the primary wheel contact band had changed on that low rail. The left hand photograph, the red arrow, is actually touching on the heeled half of the low rail. And you can if you look carefully, you can see it, you can discern a, I'll say, a, a color difference between the heeled half of the rail. Uh, and a little, a little dirtier gauge half, which isn't getting nearly the wheel traffic. Track maintenance condition number five. Um, just three quarters of a mile upstream from our test site, we had a top of rail unit. Two miles further upstream, we had a second top of rail unit. They had been turned off for the entire test. We went ahead and turned them on. We happened to turn them on the day after we installed Pandrels on the low rail. So we really didn't get a, a, a picture of a uh, low rail pandrel without top of rail. Didn't get any trains with that with that test set. Two year two top of rail units turned on. Um, we wanted to see what the low rail response was. Now that we put elastic fasteners on, open the gauge, and turn the top of rail friction modifier on. We set up our camera again. Very boring in comparison. Um, the raised spike that you see right next to the pandrel clip is not a result of rail canting out. That's just how far down that spike it was driven by the rail. Track maintenance conditions six and eight represent grinding cycles two and three. Um, grinding cycle number two, we made five passes on the low rail, again restoring a, a very nice profile with significant heel and gate side relief. We realized our mistake the first time we did we ground the high rail and we came back with two passes that emphasized field side relief. We're trying to get that high wheel, high rail contact band moved from the field side back toward the center of the rail. A few weeks later, we came back with grinding cycle number three. Two more passes on the high rail, emphasizing field side relief. And here are the mini prop profiles of that high rail. And uh, post grind cycle number one is shown in blue. Uh, our, the, the impact of grinding cycle number two is shown uh, by the difference between the blue line and the red line. And the uh, Results of grinding cycle number three, the difference between the red line and the brown line. You can see that we've really gone after field side relief, trying to get that wheel off the field side and move back toward the middle of the rail. Track maintenance conditions seven and nine, uh, top of rail turned off and top of rail turned on. We toggled this on, off and on, because we wanted to try to isolate the impact of, grind, of the grinding cycles and not have it influenced by, by, uh, by top of rail. Okay, we're back to this guy. Um, to review, 
horizontal axis is train number, 1 through 560. Vertical axis is lateral forces, 0 to 25 pips. Each dot represents the average force for an entire train for one of four wheel positions. Top graph shows the uh, lead wheel high in pink, lead wheel low in blue. Bottom graph shows trail wheel high in pink, trail wheel low in blue. We start out on the uh, maximum forces where the low rail, far right hand, left hand side of the graph. Uh, you see a start a test date of uh, April 19, 2011. Low rail forces between 15 and 17 pips. High rail forces between 10 and 15 pips. Trailing axle uh, dramatically lower. And that's typical of, of curving. Um, lead axles generally much higher than, than trail axles. Grinding cycle number one. Um, we didn't see an impact to that grinding cycle, but keep in mind, we made a mistake on our high rail and didn't help ourselves. In fact, we hurt ourselves by grinding away the gauge corner and keeping that wheel contact band on the, on the field side. Then we put the panels in on the high rail and tight gauge, and oh my goodness. Uh, low rail forces jumped over 20 tips. High rail forces, a little bit higher. Not, not nearly as dramatically uh, changed as the low rail. What do you notice about the trailing truck? Or I'm sorry, the trailing axle? A dramatic increase there as well. Um, we attribute that uh, to the tight gauge as much as anything. Um, but it may also have an impact with, and they may have been impacted by having different fasteners on high and low rail as well. We're not sure. We came along with the low rail and installed the panels on June 21st, turned the top of rail on, and we had a dramatic drop in forces, uh, down between 5 and 10 tips uh, on the lead axle, and probably between 4 and 7 tips on the trailing axle. Conditions remain fairly constant until grinding cycle number 2, and there is a perceptible decrease in lateral forces as a result of that grinding. Remember that grinding, not only did we restore the low rail to a good profile, we really went after the gates, the field side relief on that high rail, trying to move that wheel back toward the center. Top of rail turned off. Perhaps a slight increase on the, uh, on the, on the lead axle. Grinding cycle number three seems to have had a, you know, more of a positive impact on, on, on trailing wheels than it did on lead wheels. Top of rail turned back on, that was the final maintenance uh, condition, gave us our lowest lateral forces of the test, uh, between five and nine pips on the uh, leading axle, and generally under five pips on the trailing axle. Any questions on the graph? Remind me again how you're measuring lateral force. We have, how, how are we measuring lateral force? We have strain gauges um, set up, um, two uh, pair of strain gauges, field and gauge side of the web, which measure vertical force. No, lateral. David, help me out. Oh. And then we have um, strain gauges on the base flange, uh, both gauge and field side. I'm just trying to get to this. It, it sort of, I guess, intuitively stands to reason that if you secure the high rail better, you can translate your engineering home motion to low wheel because that's the only remaining source of flexibility in the system, right? Any motion is going to be taken out essentially on the low rail. But I'm curious whether that's actually just displacement or whether that's a, you know, is the displacement a proxy for lateral force or is it, are you really changing the lateral force or is the lower rail just moving more because the upper rail can't? Um, I think I might rephrase the question here. Um, you have different fasteners on the two rails, fixed one side, flexible other side. Uh, continue. If there's a, it seems like the force, even if the forces were, even if the force was the same, and the system, force in the system was the same as before, if your high rail is nailed down better by these plastic fasteners, it seems like your low rail is going to be the only thing that could move. And, and it is the only thing that moves. Right. So, but is that really an indication of increased lateral force in the system, or is that just increased displacement? Um, is, is that increased, all right, increased measure, does that explain increased lateral force? Um, that
That's actually one of our test objectives in 2012. Um, we're not sure why we had the dramatic increase in force, and we're not sure why we had the dramatic decrease in force because we had change in gauge and change in capacitance. The only thing, I, the only light I can shed on that, I, I, I'm familiar with a, um, a derailment report that was written by Transport uh, Transportation Safety Board of Canada. Canada following the CN derailment. And the, re the derailment conditions, fairly similar to this, elastic fasteners on the high rail to cut spikes on the low rail had existed for a very long time. And according to the uh, vampire simulation they did, that change in fastener system, or the, 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 the inconsistency in fastener system was a contributing factor in that track geometry Variations in gauge, variations in, alignment, variations in alignment, excited the truck, applied, resulted in a much higher lateral force than normal applied to the high side. High side was able to withstand that because of the, the premium fastener system. Low force gener uh, transfer to the low rail, low rail wasn't able to withstand it. Um, I'm figuring that if we've got a steady state without track inputs from gauge, alignment, or surface variation, I wouldn't think we would have greater lateral forces. Should have the same based on real contact pattern. Right. Father, you may have said this earlier on, but are these trains on these curves typically operating in an underbalance and overbalance? The question is uh, are these trains operating underbalance or overbalance? Um, 7.8 degree curve, 4 inches of super elevation, 25 miles per hour. Um, they are operating at a fairly dramatic underbalance speed. This curve is overbalanced for elevation. Balance speed for 7.8 degrees and 4 inches is 27 miles per hour. Timetable speed is 25. Most trains operated through there anywhere from 21 to 24. So th this would strike, this would speak to Chris's point because if you're in that condition, it seems, it would seem to me that what's happening You've got you've got much greater weight distribution on the low rail than the high rail. Right. So I'm, and the, the more that condition exists, I would think the less the condition of the high rail would affect the low rail. Um, you're looking at the contribution to lateral forces of centrifugal force and super elevation versus the contribution of steering. We have found that steering is a much bigger factor. Okay. That's, that's actually I've got slides of that on the, in the, in the supplemental section. If you're interested. Question. Yes. Is there any significance to those five transients there? The end at after 421. The where are we at here? The transients. Seems like there's spikes there at 421. Four. Oh here. Yeah yeah. Um, just anomalous. All right. Uh, and, and you've got the same thing on the. On the uh, uh, leading axis as well. Those are average forces for an entire train. We have not done the research to determine why that may be the case. Are they, is, this, uh, a, a set, a, is it the same set of equipment? Because the, the trains that run on this line load in the West Virginia coal mines, run to power plants in, in Virginia or the port of Norfolk, come back empty and do the same thing all over again. Uh, to some extent, the outliers may be the same train. Uh, there may be a weather factor. Uh, one of the things that we have not done that I hope to do is to uh, better identify which trains are the outliers and what explanation can we offer to the fact that they seem to be so much different than, 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 than the average. One more quick point. I think in addressing Chris's question, is that really you may have indicated this was recent. All right, question is, uh, uh, are we creating plants to measure displacement? Um, we pretty much decided, decided to use lateral forces as a proxy for everything. Um, 
The fact that we've got elastic fasteners on both rails has pretty much eliminated our displacement measurements anyway. Okay. We're going from lateral forces to lateral over vertical force ratio. Here we've got L over Z for the same 560 trains, truck side. Each data point represents the average truck side L over V for an entire loaded coal train, blue equal low rail, pink equals to high rail. And understandably, this graph has an identical shape to the graph before, which was lateral forces. Reason why? All of the cars that we're running have the same vertical weight. So that is, that is something that's in common through this entire test. These are all 286K loaded coal cars. Final graph. Um, now we're looking at lateral forces for two entire trains. All right? Lead axle by lead axle. You got a blue train, you got a red train. Each data point is a lead wheel from one or uh, one of two loaded coal trains. Blue, train, blue train shows the worst condition. Remember the video? Pandrels on the high rail, cut spikes on the low rail. Blue train was uh, actually one of those that we videoed. And the red train shows the optimum condition. That was post grind cycle three and after we turned the top of rail on. And let's let's look at uh, uh, the bottom graph. which is the uh, lead axle low wheel. And you can see that the majority of axle forces or wheel forces are between 20 and 25 ticks. The blue train, much lower, between 5 and maybe 12 ticks uh, for the red train on the low rail. And you've got a, sim a similar spread uh, on the high rail, though, not nearly as, I mean, similar trend, but not nearly as great. The numbers are much smaller under the high rail. Um, let's look at the low graph and the blue train. What do, you, what do you notice about that? You watch that train go by in video. Majority of axles show very high lateral force between 20 and 25 tips. There are some axles, however, that are much lower. Do you remember when you watched the video? The rail spent most of its time at a fairly large can angle, but on, on, on some of the cars, the rail can settle back down. That's, that's, I'm correlating the two of those. High lateral forces, low lateral forces, and, uh, and likely rail position. How are we doing? Conclusions. At the risk of stating the obvious, Tight gauge and field side contact can generate very high lateral forces. Track maintenance tasks that restore a rail to its normal upright position can have the unintended consequence of causing field side contact. That's one of the big problems that we've had. I mentioned we had a bunch of railroad over derailments. A factor, a feature that was in common to some, but not all, was the, uh, was the fact that, that cur the curve where we derailed in the year, six months prior to railroad, <coughs> had been maintained either with a gauging gang or with a tie gang, and a rail that had been existing in a canted out position had now been set back upright and a wheel contact pattern changed. Very similar to what we think we almost did with track maintenance condition number three on this test. Number three, managing the wheel rail interface, gauge, rail profiles, fasteners, top of rail, can lower lateral forces. And three more. Number four, cut spikes do not provide sufficient vertical restraint under adverse wheel rail contact. Number five, elastic fasteners appear able to outmuscle high lateral forces caused by adverse wheel rail contact. And finally, and, and this, this is critically important to, to guys who are like track supervisors, division engineers who are responsible for maintaining the track, the progression of cant the rail rollover depends on the strength of your track and whether or not there are any changes to where the wheel con wheel is contacting the rail. 
The important point is, it's not an overnight phenomenon. It's a, based on our observations, it's a, it's a gradual phenomenon with the rail working the spikes up a little bit by a little bit. And if you're a visual track inspector, you should be able to find that. You should be able to see that before you get yourself into trouble as a driver. All right, our uh, objectives for this year, uh, we want to try to answer this question. What caused the dramatic force reduction at wills? When we went from track condition maintenance three with panels on the high side to condition number four where we had elastic passes on both sides. Was it the gauge? We opened the gauge three eighths of an inch when we, when we laid that low rail with new, with new plates. Was it the fact that we now have the same fastening system on both rails? How much did rail profiles play, uh, uh, play a role? And, and top of rail, what, did they, what, what role did that play? Um, I'm going to go ahead and back up and look at my graph one more time. Okay. Um, I'm looking at track maintenance condition. I'm looking on the right hand side of the graph where we turned the top of rail off uh, by around train, say, 450, and we turned it back on uh, at train 503. Um, very, very modest change in lateral forces, which caused us to go back to June 21st when we turned first turning top of rail on and ask the question, did that make any difference? I mean, it didn't make any difference later in the test. Perhaps it didn't make any difference earlier in the test. So now we're looking at really just two variables to explain the dramatic drop in forces, the elastic faster change and the gauge change. And what we decided was that the three quarters of a mile and two miles, which were the lo locations of the top of rail unit from our test curve, were too far to consistently carry down top of rail friction modifier. Um, we're on a downhill grade. We have air brakes working on the trains that tend to wear the uh, top of rail friction modifier off more rapidly than otherwise. And we have a bunch of sharp curves between the, uh, the last unit and our test site. So one of our test objectives this year is to install a new top of the rail unit right at the beginning of the curve where we'll know we'll have top of rail friction modifier on the wheels as they roll by. And uh, we'll get a better sense of whether or not top of rail is, is effective or not. The shape of this graph for maximum force instead of average? Uh, shape of the graph, the question is, did we look at the uh, graph for maximum force versus um, versus average. No, we have not. Um, QEM may have done that, um, but I have not looked at that data. Um, we did for two trains, the graphs that show the test results for lateral forces for the blue train and the red train. Those are the only two trains we looked at in detail. All right, second thing. Can wheel rail contact be managed and lateral forces kept low enough such that elastic fasteners are not needed? Um, this is a big deal because a, a pandrel plate, such as what we installed at Wills, is 50% more than a conventional 8 by, 8 kind of 8 by 18 inch type plate, including all the OTM. The spikes and anchors with the regular type plate, the spikes and, and, and E-clip for the pandrel. So going with a premium fastener, we're paying 50% more for our fastening system. And if we do, if we can manage our wheel rail interface such that we can manage our lateral forces, maybe we don't need to invest the big bucks into a, a premium system. That's what we're looking at this year. We established a second test site east of Roanoke, um, and uh, we look to maintain 8 by 18 tie plates here for, for the foreseeable future. We got this instrumented in terms of the strain gauge the same way as we had at the, at the, wheel, at the site up at Wills. Hold on. Any questions? Any more questions? There's a question from one of our listeners here, from Sean Richmond. It says, when you measure vertical and lateral load from strain gauges on the rail, how do you account for the lateral position of the wheel on the rail since it will change the moment on the whip? Um, we don't. We just, we, we take a look at the output from our strain gauge bridge 
and based on the calibration that we uh, conducted at the beginning and periodically through the test, um, we turned that electrical signal into a lateral force and a vertical force, and that's our data. We have a, um, a test rig, an aluminum A-frame that has uh, um, a pair of hydraulic cylinders and an interpack hand-operated hydraulic pump. And uh, we, we preload the, uh, um, the rail, I think, at 15 or 20,000 pounds and a lateral load. Um, I think somewhere six to 12,000 pounds. I don't remember the exact numbers. Um, knowing what forces we apply, we know what the signal is. That's our calibration. So it's, it's, a, it's a load fixture that, uh, we, uh, that we apply to the track. And we've actually <coughs> calibrated three, uh, three times here uh, because twice we came along the rail gang and actually removed the rail to change the tie plates and then reinstall that rail. We calibrated that after that, same thing with the load side. And uh, we've also calibrated it after a servicing job, the servicing gang came through. Um, and then uh, a third time just because it had been eight months. The question is what the degree of cant generates an exception? NS uses three degrees average over 50 feet. Uh, we collect, can is, 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 is measured by um, a uh, laser camera optical system every two feet. And in the course of 25 readings, if the average exceeds three degrees, we generate a new Master graph. Sorry. You may be able to answer this without the graph. Between the point in time in which you had a lack of cash and which was installed on both rails, yeah. and somebody coming top rail lubrication, um, was that, it, it looked like you may have a few data points that were up if you're top rail. Um, I don't know the resolution of the data. How many trains went by it? The question is, uh, did we have any trains operate between um, low rail handles installed and top of rail turned on? Uh, the answer is no, we didn't. That is um, my effort to make sure that the arrows didn't cover the data. We did not run any trains um, with, uh, uh, with, with before we turned the top of rail. All righty. Thank you very much. Just one question.